Madam Clerk, please call roll. Good afternoon. Mr. Good afternoon. Brennan. Present. Mr. Rickman. Here. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Present. Mr. Vaughn. Here. Mr. Davis. Mayor Benjamin. Here. I know Mr. Davis is present. Here. Yes, Right. Here. <laughs> well, Mr. So that does not count. He's in the hallway. He's waiting on the pizza. We're doing his work. He's waiting to get his work. He's at it. Hey, I've been here since 9 30. You're a little wet. Wait till 6. I know. I know. All right. Uh, Tracy, what do you got? Oh, yeah. I'm afraid of a doubt. Oh Lord, for the beauty of this day and for all you've done for us, for the ability to arise this morning with health and strength undergirding us, we ask for your blessings upon each of us as we gather around this table and in this conference room. Bless this city of ours. Be mindful of the needs that are there, and yet sensitize us to those needs. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Getting started with city council discussion, Mr. Mayor. Our first item is the adoption of a new city flag. Mr. Lee Snellfield, Executive Director of North Columbia for Arts and Culture, and I'm sure there are things that may want to chime in a little bit on this. Oh, yeah, so let's, let's talk to you. We'll have some time to discuss this individually between now and the um, council meeting. Lee, I'm going to push you out of your comfort zone a little bit. All right. I have a comfort zone. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever been. I'm going to push you into your discomfort zone. How about that? All right. Let's do it. No, no. Just, just, I want to make sure we got, we got a lot of council. We got some consistency, some unity, some um, uh, uh, designs that kind of these are not, not, no one actually, none of the guys here have a majority of, of support. Um, what I specifically want you to make sure you speak to is the design league and, and maybe some of the input they've given you. And I'm going to try to say vexillogical. Is that the right way? Yes. Yeah, uh, vexillogical principles, just making sure we're hearing what those principles are look like. And, and, I, and they we're all um, big boys and we're women in here. We're, we don't, we, we don't mind having your frank input as, as to as to what we're going to do for making a decision for posterity. Uh, yeah, how, how it, every one of these things talks about the public. Yeah. I think it'd be important because yeah, sure. rehash all the well, public ha, input. Ha, how yeah. the public input was brought in. Because yeah. there's some people who don't yeah, feel like they knew yeah. about the process, but there has been a long process. Oh, yes. a very a very long process. So maybe, maybe I think of those. I think repetition is, is probably key to these types of uh, big decisions. Making sure people understood the, understand the entire process from here. Thank you. Okay, and I will try and recap that from memory because I didn't I didn't sure. bring enough notes on that. But um, uh, that was on the previous. Is this my time? Is this my time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, look at this at hand. Um, okay, so <clears throat> one day we tell it comes in really handy. He got me pretty good this morning. So, uh, that was okay. Fair enough. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the designs that you all identified from the previous presentation. These are preferences, and we'll talk about e groups of designs or each one, and I'll kind of give you the best I can of. I want to be very objective if I can, and uh, talk about. Yes, the public input and the professional input, both the vexillologists and the design lead professionals that are involved in the process. Um, as, I, as we discussed last time, you know, when we started on this process, we, we opened the call for public input and we received 544 designs. So I showed those last time in a quick video. We sent that off to the uh, professional vexillologists and they uh, identified a top 18 and then that um, became what was submitted to the public. The public provided input on all of those, and we received 7,000 entries, and that's comments on each design. So the public provided their input on each design and a sort of number ranking. We didn't ask them to select one. We actually asked them to weigh in on all of the designs. So when I talk about the public input, 
I am, may not be talking about the public input directly on the designs you have in your packet, but similar size because this second round of designs was provided by the designers of the top designs from the last process. So essentially their work was reviewed. Many of them, because they were in the top, utilized those designs and just retweaked them to meet the guidelines that you provided them. So I can, t I can sort of speak from the public input because of that, because we do at least have their comments, we have their rankings, we know what, was, uh, what they were sort of responding to, what they weren't responding to well. And I think that shows in here, and I tried to capture that in what I provided you in those notes, and I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, so, um, so where we're at now, we, we are essentially, after you all um, discussed it, there were 14 designs that kind of rose to the top from your, your recognitions, and I, I've listed on the document you have about who's preferred one, who, who listed that one as a preferred one. Um, I do have my copy of Good, Bad, Fly, Bad Flag, so I can refer to it at any point if you have questions. Um, all right, so we'll start off with, essentially, I, I've got the first three, um, which I think we can talk about as a group. So one, two, and three are all very similar. You can see that. They're all from the same designer, obviously. Um, and, and essentially, this one was well received by the public, the professionals, and the jury members. Um, I think that what we do know, though, is that the public wasn't entirely keen on the use of a crescent as a reference to Columbia. Even though it works well on the South Carolina flag in context with the palmetto tree, many people did not respond to it well when it sort of stood alone without the palmetto tree. Um, so typically, you know, there was discussion I know among the jury about changing similar designs to this one uh, to a star, and, and perhaps that could be discussed. But I think that overall people like this design for the reference to three rivers in the wing. I do think there are <coughs> issues with how this shape might be used off the flag in other instances and other references to the city because of the uh, length of the lines and trying to get that balance right and get the weight of the lines right. And I think that still applies to this version, which sort of standardizes them all the way across, and this version, um, which has even more sort of difference in balance between all those lines. Um, and, and it simply looks, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I think, you know, lacks some sort of reference to Capital City that might be worthwhile. But I do, I think, most of the professionals would say that this, this does meet the simplicity guidelines um, for, you know, good flag, you know, does, 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 does. Yeah, it's obviously very simple, two colors, three lines. Um, and I think you get the, the, the wing for sure in that design. Um, okay, so then we'll go on to the next set here. And stop me if you have questions along the way, or I can just go back to them at the end. Um, this one and this one were provided, obviously, by the same designer. Um, and uh, while I think this, this certainly meets the simplicity criteria, um, one issue, I think, for this flag, and, and the shape is interesting, but I think that the, the problem is it's a white flag. And that can sometimes be hard to see on a pole when this flag might be hanging limp you're not gonna recognize those three lines. And it could be hard to identify as a Columbia flag. Most flags of this design limp, you're not gonna be able to see either. True. I mean, and I enough, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think there are certain elements, right? If you can capture some of the color or some of the, the star or something like that, it'll be pretty quickly recognizable. South Carolina flag, not always recognizable when it's right. hanging limp, but, but generally, you know, in context, it will be. I, I, Lee, just out of curiosity, yeah. since you spend a lot of time, something, something that got brought up before that nobody really answered is, is how come none of the designs incorporated the light blue color that seems to have been kind of, is it for the same reason? I mean, no, like predominant, and there's a little bit in there, but not, you know. That's one of your first questions, back when. Yeah, some, some, I, I think that um, there were some responses that came from that, people alluding back to it. Part of the problem is people don't really know our current flag well, and I think there's actually even a disagreement between whether it should be light blue or dark blue. The okay. original design was dark blue. Was dark blue. Uh, if you look back on all the documents of what was uh, you know adopted by uh, over 100 years ago, like what was adopted, it was a it was a dark blue field, and somewhere along the way it changed to light blue, <laughs> and not really an explanation why. So uh, there may not be that allegiance to that light blue. Um, light blue flags do fade, and I'll talk about that in some of the designs later. Um, you know, in the 
in the sun that can turn to white. And I've seen that of our current flag uh, on the front of the police department at one time years ago when we first started this process. They were flying one that just got faded and it was pretty white. And so that you lose that when it's a full light blue flag. In this whole process, you could throw a kind of a, a monkey wrench, but what if we like the design like that, but did but change the colors? So I think we've taken the tack of, you know, we've got the designs that submitted, but I'll talk a little bit about how we might work with the designer to make some alterations that could fit if you were really strongly preferring a certain design. Um, that we could adjust it. Most of these designers, I have, I have a sense from them, they will be comfortable with some changes, uh, depending upon as long as they don't lose the core concept of their design. Um, but I, I think there are ways that we can make some slight tweaks, some, most of these, to improve them as flags, and we can discuss that. So, the, go ahead. Yes, sir. Mr. Max, please. The, um, if you would, uh, go back to number one, please. The movement with the the idea with the crescent being like what are the well, let me ask you this, what, what were the subliminal messages or were there subliminal messages that would look at the crescent as perhaps being a part of us today, being a part of our today? Um, I mean I, I think that some portion of the general public may have seen uh, the connection that some flags of Islamic nations, particularly like Turkey, might have on their flag, but I, you know that it's sort of irrelevant because we know for sure it is a crescent tied to the South Carolina flag. So it's odd that people were making that immediate connection. So like the Red Crescent, the service organization equivalent to the Red Cross. But I, I don't. I, there were a few citations of that, but I don't think that was the predominant view. I think that just people maybe didn't make the connection to the South Carolina flag as it's when it's a standalone crescent. Because often there's already a misnomer that that is a moon and it is not a moon. It is from the shape of the gorget of the revolutionary soldiers that represented South Carolina. It's not necessarily a, a crescent moon. Was it, was it a large percentage of those persons in that listening here in the session that have been to that? Uh, I, I don't know if I would say a large um, section, but I, I don't have the numbers to sort of quantify that. But I think that there was that sense that just as a standalone item, the crescent alone did not represent the capital. Was, you know, the, the connection to something else. Okay. Um, number five, uh, I think the, the only thing I, I know for sure about this one, I think that one thing that would need to be addressed is there's a little complexity to that sign in terms of there are actually two colors that you may not be able to see here. And some simplification of that, you might be able to see it in the printout, depending upon the quality of the yeah. printer. But I, there are some variants there that wouldn't work on a flag because of the same reasons it doesn't really work on the printout or on the screen right now. Um, but uh, overall, meets the flag, all of, pretty much all these designs meet the flag guidelines within range. Um, simplicity, I think, is the one that might get some um, play once in a while. But, uh, the, the thing that was, I think, the public responded to when this similar three-line pattern and sort of chevron shape was used that it, it referenced the military for uh, whatever that may mean. We are connected to the military, but that, um, that shape reminded people of a militaristic flag. Um, so just to make note of that. Uh, I do think that also there is a good correlation of this design to um, the Milwaukee flag, which is the People's Flag of Milwaukee, I think, I'm not sure if their council has adopted their flag, but it's in wide use. Or, and it has a similar sign coming above three lines, um, and a uh, slightly different color pattern, but uh, similar in shape and design. Um, okay, uh, so th those were by another designer. We're now on the third designer's uh, set. Um, this was very similar to a design that was in the first round um, and uh, while I think certainly the Phoenix refers to Columbia, we rose from the ashes and such in the Fe Columbia Phoenix um, paper, uh, there was some concern by the public about referring back to that event, a negative event for the city on a flag that we hope will be facing future and represent us going forward. Um, also, for you know, reference the city of Phoenix, um, their flag is 
you may not be able to see it well, but it's purple with a phoenix right slap in the middle of it. I think it's well. Phoenix University. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, the professionals really weighed in on this uh, shape of this crescent inside the star. Atlanta's quite a bit. Oh, really? Uh, so the, the professional really certainly honed in on the idea of this crescent within the star because certainly that clearly on its own, without much interpretation, really showcases. Columbia as the capital of South Carolina. So they responded highly to that. The, that's the vexillologist. Um, it is a complex shape fairly much in terms of getting the, the stars um, correct. Obviously tacking on wings makes it a little bit more complex. Um, the lines on the edge um, probably need more contrast in this case because as you can see, it's not very definitive on the screen here. Uh, so we want to help the contrast in terms of what gets put on the flag. Is isn't, isn't the channel supposed to be the, to do it from there? Yeah, within reason. I mean, you know, there are exceptions to that rule. South Africa, uh, the United States in some cases. Not every child draws out all the stars. Um, but if they can get the general gist of the idea of a flag, simplicity helps with that, yes. Um, obviously, similar complex shape of the star are the wings. Um, but one thing that was clearly told to me by Ted Kay, who wrote the Good Flag, Bad Flag, Wavy lines on flags are sort of irrelevant because flags are already wave. So any straight line on a flag is going to look wavy. So you don't need to have a wavy flag, a wavy line, because it's it's just adding to the to the mix of the waving on it. Um, this one does try and tie into the current city flag by providing Lady Justice on it. Um, obviously, that then creates a fairly complex shape of the wings. Um, and, and it does reference our current flag and the city seal, which, uh, you know, I think that one, this may be a judgment, but one thing that I think our current flag suffers from is its direct connection to the city government and not the people of the city and, and how it seems like, oh, that's just for the government. That, I'm not going to fly that because it references something above me. And we're, I think we are, if I understand correctly, we're all looking for a flag that really represents us as Colombians, as people, so that they can fly it without referring to the government all the time. Um, similar star wings, um, blue field, light blue reference um, that uh, Councilman recommend reference. Uh, uh, contrast issues, perhaps, between the wings themselves and the light blue. That's very Air Force looking. Perhaps. I would, I would draw my support for number 10. Okay. Noted. If anyone else wants to show the same profile of these shit, please. <laughs> um, this one, um, uh, so it does meet the flag guidelines, obviously. Uh, there's probably not enough contrast between the yellow star and the white field, uh, and that would need to be addressed. Uh, light blue at the bottom would fade quickly and sort of blend to the, um, the white in the middle. Um, so we're now in this last section. There are three fairly similar designs with slight uh, differences between each of them. One thing I'll say about these designs, uh, I noticed that the state of the city, the Councilwoman Devine was wearing a dress that had exactly the same color. I noticed that too. I'm not sure she realized it. <laughs> Which was very exciting that she was, she was already wearing the city, potential city flag, perhaps. Uh, again, with the press, and we've already discussed. Uh, I think, you know, just one sort of caveat to this one. You know you just got her vote, right? Uh, <laughs> <let's hope so. laughs> I'm here to persuade. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of discussion in the jury level, the professional level, uh, about the uh, having a sort of white bottom corner that, you know, that gets a little lost in the mix on a, a gray sky or something that it, it'll make that flag look a, a strange shape, not a, a rectangular shape. Um, and this one, um, we have the star incorporated here. Um, uh, I think the uh, designer notes that, um, you know, the, the six points are a nod to the state house um, as a symbol of resilience for the city. Um, you know, I, I don't think any designer is going to be completely caught up in the number of star, the number of points on the star. So that's, you know, I think up for discussion. Um, certainly, Good reference that again six of the six stars on the same. Yeah, channel. as a and symbol of resilience. You know, a traditional capital city star on a map is going to be five stars. 
Um, but then I think there's also, um, you could make the case uh, that you know, a six-point star refers to cardinal directions, perhaps, or something like that. I guess that would be an eight. Um, uh, but similar shape, uh, just in this one instance, there's sort of the um, additional blue, lower blue corner. Um, and then the final one is uh, this one, which I think um, there, there are a few issues with this, but I think overall there's, there's a nice um, structure to this middle shape that I think could be applied in a lot of different instances. Um, traditionally, the star would not be in the lower right-hand corner, and I think there are fading issues uh, with between the sort of three colors here um, that if, if it fades, you might lose some context to that shape. Um, I think there is an uh, opportunity for, as we've sort of discussed all along with any of these, and I'm going to give you an example of how we might make minor tweaks with the designer's input through the process uh, to improve it. Um, one suggestion would be, um, I'm going to go to this one first. Um, this was supposed to be the other one. But, um, so you'll see the connection to the one, but we've, we've sort of just put in some contrasting lines to give that shape some definition, and if it were to fade, it would allow that shape to keep retain its shape, and it wouldn't blend. I, I will. So this is sort of just a, a tweak of what was uh, submitted to us um, with this contrast between the shape, which I think already you'll start to see. There's distinction between three referencing the three rivers, and this shape perhaps could stand alone. Um, the Design League, when reviewing your preferences, um, there was some, someone suggested, well, what, what if we flip it over? And I think this is what happens when you flip it over. And there's some interesting element here. This is much more of a wing reference, I think. And the star is in much more traditional place. It has the contrast to it. So just to show you, I'm, just, I'm mostly just showing this as, as suggestions that some of these could take in terms of if there are issues that I've brought up, they could be improved. If you were, a, uh, but with the designer's input, we certainly want to make sure the designer could weigh in. And, and I'll say in this instance, just so so we could display this, we communicated with the designer on this option. So, is that the option that the design league thinks would be best suit the city? Um, I, I do think so. Yes, sir. Uh, it was discussed in the design league put forth. You know, a bunch of room full of design professionals certainly had uh, opinions about design. Out of these designs, as I presented them, mostly like I've just presented you, uh, this one was the top, and then this suggested alteration came to the top of the design of the board. If those would be navy blue lines between the white, the light blue, and the dark blue. Yes, sir. I do think it might be worth um, just a minor alteration to discuss how that um, shape closes itself out at the top right, but that's minor. Um, I think the general idea is there that the shape would be the wing shape. I think that I can imagine um, that shape being used in a lot of instances um, on its own, without the star, or without the rectangular flag, that that shape could uh, become sort of more iconic for Columbia. Uh, it shows forward progression, it shows a wing, it shows the three rivers, um, which is all the things we use to identify ourselves. And so the because of the navy blue lines, if it fades, it won't lose the color. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Got it. You don't like that? I don't like that at all. Where's your taste? What's what's the pattern? Are we about to caucus? What's going on here? Are we, are we, <laughs> how we that's, a, that's a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we maybe we, we have to talk to each other. Yeah, yeah. Right. We, can talk, we, can, we can speak out loud and share some thoughts right now. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So I, you know, I've been paying attention for this. Lee, thanks for all the hard work. And thanks for all the hard work for a couple, two, three years. It's been going on. And uh, if you saw my my yard signs in camp my campaign, you saw the blue and yellow. So I like the blue and yellow. <laughs> I specifically like number three. It gives uh, homage to the state flag, the blue, the gold to the corn, uh, for the tribute to the original flag. The three rivers I love. The three rivers being an all <coughs> flag. And then the, the wing rising up from the ashes. It's simple, um, but I think uh, it, it, it's very sharp. So that's kind of my, my thought process to, to behind why I like number three. I like four, and I like four if we change the colors to the, to the yellow and gold. 
because I think that really distincts the three rivers. I um, think the write up, if you read the write up in here, that's what captured me too was the come together collectively in form of a broader shape. The wing captures the diversity of Columbia, the character and strength of Columbia stems from diverse groups coming together, which is, I think, what we've all been working for for a long time. And I think that really is a transition away from what some of the commendations are on the old flag. So from a color standpoint, if you could change the colors, I think that represents our city the strongest, in my opinion. Can you just send to me? individual input. I am. I feel strongly about the, the revised version that we uh, presented at 14, um, and also um, secondarily, um, <coughs> three. Um, my, my key, uh, that, that we'll um, just um, mention uh, as well, I do, I do feel like the narratives articulated almost apply to almost all the flags, with, with the exception of a few outliers that we didn't have to, um, but you know, we, we, we wanted uh, working around uh, the Wayne's language, um, Senator Day's quote uh, on the Wings of Columbia. Uh, of course, the narratives between future and flying, rising from the ashes, and the ultimate, there's a whole lot there. And the, um, the wings that also contemplate the rivers, I think they're fantastic. I also like the simplicity of the, the three. Uh, I, 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 like, I like having some reference to the capital. I wonder if it might be worthwhile. I was going through and, um, uh, yeah, well, us worthwhile maybe to just taking out some of the ones that, that we don't want first might, 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 might be easy to eliminate some. Uh, if y'all want to come through some of that. Yeah. Lee, on number three, could, two things. Number one, could we put a star, a six-pointed star to represent the star that's on the state house? Uh, I don't have words from the designer about that. I, I would imagine since they've submitted one of the cross on that, perhaps they'd be open to discussion about it. And, and uh, why, what was the significance of not having the Doe uh, Rivers go all the way to the board? Well, they do that in the one previous it. Um, and I think it's the reason they're not doing it on that one is because they're using that sort of flared shape for the wing. Sure. So that will mean a wing. Yeah. Yeah. It's to get more of a wing. Okay. I'd, I'd like three with a star. It says, it says Kurt's right hand. Uh, um, so, uh, obviously, Ms. Devon, you okay if you remove number yeah. one? Yeah, I was going to say I was wrong. Uh, number Mr. one. Mr. Devon, Devon, you, you, you put number two. Uh, you want to take that one out of contention? I will give up number two uh, and support of number three with a star. Uh, so let's, um, mm -hmm. Can we? Um, we take out the other one of the support of the fact that victory starts here. We take the more militaristic one. So it's like the five people flag Milwaukee. That's five. That's number five. Remove that one from contention. Five, five, six, five seven. Is that one? Five, six, and seven. No. Which one, which one do you want to leave in there? Seven. Seven. Right. Everyone's leave seven in your shit. Let's take six out. You got the heat jazz one. <laughs> <laughs> seven. <laughs> I think we have more than six. Uh, take it out. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to take out six, not seven, this year. discussion. We're taking eight out. Is that correct, Mr. Devine? Is Devine, yeah. Mr. Devine? Yeah, I'm fine with that. And we're, and we're doing the people's flag, not the government flag, so we're taking out number nine. Fair? <clears throat> we still have the city seals representing the uh, justice. All right? Mm -hmm. Devon, uh, I'm sorry, that was A. Did you follow? Let's take nine out. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. My, 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 my number 10 out. All right. Uh, Ms. Davis, what do you say about 11? Um, 11 Keep it up. Keep it up. All right. Got it. So we're going 11 right now. Uh, we'll take out 12 and 13, and we'll have versions of 14. We'll take out 12 and 13. We'll have the various uh, versions of 14 um, still in the mix. So that leaves us. 14, 3, 4, 7. All right, is that right? That's an alternate 3, is that right? We want that alternate 3. Alternate 4, too. Four, yeah, I'm sorry. 7. Yeah. Plus. Oh. 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 Oh.
Okay. The, um, so we continue to narrow down, and I know you said you wanted to keep seven, but going under the guidelines, seven is not really simplistic. It's, it's got a lot of stuff. Real busy. It's real, it's real busy. It's not creative eyes. See, people is this. Uh, you feel the beauty, about and I can just tell. I feel the like, woo, look at it. I feel that creative juice. Oh, God. Lee, watch out. He's coming back to your job. He's feeling the creativity. This is the thing. This is the thing. Let me, uh, please. I, I, I hear you, by the way. Um, yeah, I uh, was on the original committee. The first one? Yeah, the current one? No, no. The original committee. It's The delayed reaction. Okay. Okay. I, was, I was headed in that direction anyway. But the, uh, the, the favors right now uh, represent, um, I think, the the initial intent of that was to come up with something that's one you unique, different, and uh, for the purpose of representing Columbia or what we stand for. And I think you noticed that my uh, first selection there coming up from the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. That's you know, that's fine, but, but the only problem with that would be that. As you rise, you still stand above what was there, where you're coming from. And then the final selection really represents that um, uniqueness and uh, shows the evolution of, 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 of design in general, going back to reflect. Um, I think right now, with, with the majority, things really represents them. Nothing is circular. Yeah, nothing is circular, which is traditional. It's all abstract to some extent. When, when I took art classes way back, I thought abstract was the thing. You know, you was doing with a pencil, right? That's okay. It's all about with crayons, man. Me too, man. You work with what you got. But, but my, my point is, though, um, and honestly, when you look at flags today around the world, it, it does not represent uh, a lot of the traditional shapes and, and figures. And this one doesn't. So I think it's uh, it's. Uh, it's saying a lot about us and, and wanting to come up with a, an original stamp that represents the entire city versus city government. I like that. I like it. Mr. what I would do, and I'd like to have some further conversation with me, I'd pull number seven. But I do want to have some conversation with you about uh, three and seven. Please make this dude can not do his own play. We'll cut that conversation off very quickly. He's got his own way. Yeah, Why not a play? Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. We're down to 14 being the ultimate 114. Yes. I can do that. That's the design. I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to the board from the board. Already got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the old Yeah. I think I got the consensus. Yeah, the consensus. It's the one that they don't have to look at them like, though. Right. I, I, I'm not ready for that one. I mean, I just be honest. I, I, I don't. I, I don't think it's great at all. So we're down to two. Number three and number 14A. Mm -hmm. That way I'm that. If we can't, have, do we have to go back to the designer to get a redesign of board? It would be worth having a conversation. I don't have to give up a redesign from that, but I can talk to you. This is what I'm 
Yeah. Where's the stubborn just in the middle? I agree with Steve on some of the narrative. Like, I, I um, like if we did 14, did. I think that's the same. one, and I like the narrative description there, but it doesn't talk about, um, you know, the, like, I think, three. You know, three comes out, you know, in this town, which, you know, has some just- Good quote, yeah, and, and we, we provided that to all the designers in the second round as one of the references for why we were asking them for a wing shape, and so they, they may not have included in their description, because they felt like they were already responding to it. But certainly, I think- I'll, I'll, let, us, I'll let us say the history as, as, as we lay out our final note, these articulate, it's kind of looked into the process, so, um, so our process. So, um, all right, so we're down three and fourteen. Eight. Fourteen, nine. no, I think Daniel still wants four. I like four. But I might be the only one. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah. I think we ought to get you a I want to paint it. I want to paint it. Yeah. Yeah, let's see where you put it. Yeah, that's what Dow did. A few weeks ago, you know, they got on every other beat. You didn't know what I did. First birthday? I had a sign. You put it on sports. Yeah, they got like. They came through and said, man, you're going to change the name of the street. Yeah. All right, so um, with, the, with, the, with the asterisk that Mr. Rigging is a hold up, no four. Uh, one note, it's been pointed out that um, Councilman McDowell's socks have these couple of them. Oh, yeah. Would you make it up my feet for a minute? Would you make it up my feet for a minute? Would you make it up my feet for a minute? Did they do that with the socks with your guys? I appreciate the observation. Three and fourteen on the road. Um, yeah. Fine with this representation. With your, with your I like 14 Oh, here, but I think that's the front runner right now. Some time between now and this evening. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm just going to get my <laughs> You know, as we said, we've already engaged the zone with 14. We okay. have response, but I can go for three and four just to confirm. All right. Thank you, Leader. I don't Thank think you. that I, there, there's only one person who likes four against me. So. I'll still get you an answer. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Our next item is the Columbia Compass Comprehensive Plan Update. Several wonderful planning staff members here. Ms. Lee D. Ford, Planning and Development Services Comprehensive Planner, Mr. John Fellows, Planning and Development Services Planning Administrator, and Mr. John Lee Guy, Ward, Vice President, and Ms. Lee Ann King, Clarion Associate.
Um, I wanted to just briefly overview each of the nine elements of the comprehensive plan. So um, just wanted to give you a slide about each and then we'll, we'll turn it over. So the population element um, is really the analytical backbone of the plan. So this looks at existing demographic trends and anticipated shifts in needs and desires. So it really helps us predict some of those needs going forward. The natural resources chapter um, also takes a look at existing conditions and it makes recommendations for programs, policies, and partnerships that help us move forward some of those uh, commitments that council has made, like being ready for 100% clean renewable energy and being prepared for <coughs> natural hazards. The economic development section looks at information about the Midlands workforce and our employers, and it also makes recommendations regarding the cities and regions economic development efforts. The housing chapter, which Leanne King will talk about in further detail, does also include a market and policy analysis and a number of recommendations. And the transportation section, which Jonathan Guy is here to talk about today, also looks at trends, it incorporates walk by Columbia recommendations and sets forth policy and infrastructure recommendations as well. The land use chapter, um, you guys are pretty familiar with, we've, we've done a, a pretty substantial update to the land use chapter in 2015, so we carried a lot of that forward, but we also um, are making some recommended changes to some of the future land use maps, and there are a handful of recommendations in there about um, other land use issues such as greenway development. The community facilities chapter is a little bit of a catch-all. So this chapter really talks about not only our buildings, but how we operate as a city, some of the services and programs we provide, and makes recommendations about those. And the cultural resources chapter, um, Lee, what's here? Run away. Yeah. Lee was also in involved on that. So the cultural resources chapter is like a partnership with Amplify, the Amplify process that y'all have been engaged on, um, taking forward some of those recommendations as well as some recommendations and existing conditions regarding Columbia's cultural identity and historic preservation, those sorts of things. Um, and just a brief overview, hopefully y'all have had a chance to kind of dig into the plan as, as we've got it posted, um, and we'll be coming back to you certainly in the near future. But um, the meat of the plan, you know, each of those elements are chapters within the plan, and the meat of those chapters is the recommendations of the plan. So each of the recommendations, we identify the elements on the screen that you see before you. Um, and a number of the recommendations that we've made, we've also tried to identify case studies for. So best practices <coughs> for, for moving those implementations forward, whether they're things that we're already doing in our community that we can do on a larger scale, or if they're things that we're doing in other communities. Um, and then the priority investment chapter is a, is a little bit different. This element summarizes all of the recommendations we've made, made throughout the planning process. And it does have one recommendation out of its own, and that recommendation is to come back to y'all with an annual report. So we really wanna make sure that we're reporting back to you on the successes and, and potentially the failures of the planning process so that we can continue to keep you guys engaged, continue to keep um, not just y'all, but the public engaged because we know that our planning processes are most successful when we really have those partnerships to bring these things forward. Um, just a brief overview of our next steps. We had some great public meetings in January. We had about 130 people over the course of four meetings, which was great for us. Um, really good discussion throughout those public meetings. We're taking public comments on the draft plan through February 7th, so if you know anyone that's been itching to get their comments to us, just remind them that's this Friday. And the reason we're, we're setting that timeline is we really wanna make sure that we can get those back out and edited, and that draft out and edited to hit Planning Commission in March. Uh, Planning Commission has been very involved in the process. We've talked to them about each of the chapters. We've reviewed all the drafts. We've, we've been having kind of ongoing discussions with, about, with them about the public feedback to the feedback. Yeah. And um, they are, of course, charged with making a recommendation to y'all on the adoption of the plan. At that point, we would hope to move it forward to you. Is there any areas of the city that you've gotten less participation in the comments? Because I know you've had several around the city, but is there is there a particular area where maybe between now and Thursday, Thursday night is the last one? Uh, Friday. Friday, okay. Uh, but there's one Thursday night. Oh, no, we don't have any meetings, but okay. Friday is the end for the comments. So our meetings were all So we can encourage right. that input from if there's a particular area that has not really been yeah. met involved. That's a great question. I mean, it's it's difficult with the with the physical meetings. Sometimes folks don't provide us with their with their zip codes or, or what areas are from. These last um, four meetings we met kind of in quadrants throughout the city, and we saw good participation at each of those. Um, 
early on when we were doing some of our interactive online surveys, we did try and track that participation by zip code. Um, we had pretty good, probably, participation throughout. Our best participation was in the 29201 and 29205 zip codes. But we, what we did is then we took that data as the surveys were still open and we used that to boost Facebook posts in the, in the other areas and that sort of thing. So we, we hope we've gotten a pretty good framework. I mean, I would say I was pleasantly surprised when we were at Richland Library Southeast all the way down Garnes Ferry where we are at Richland St. Andrews up Broad River Road and we had 30 people show up to a meeting, which is, which is good for us. So, um, so I like to think that we've, we've done a good job of that throughout this process, but that doesn't mean that um, you know, we'll, we'll still probably have folks to say, oh, I hadn't heard about this, but um, we, we hope we've, we've pushed it effectively. Yeah, I have questions. Yeah. Can we put together milestones mm -hmm. as we move forward with the approved plan eventually as to what we're going to be done one year, two years, five years down the road? Is, are y'all going to recommend that? Yeah, so that's part of the reporting and actually part of the priority investment element as well. So the priority investment element, what we've done um, is set forth kind of a short, medium, or long-term priority for each recommendation. So the short would be, we would do it within the first one to three years, medium would be four to six, long would be seven to 10 plus. Um, and the reason we've, we've done that, and we've kind of gotten folks feedback on that as well, and we've also gotten feedback from different departments on that, is that um, that'll give us an idea of kind of where we think our abilities are and our priorities are. We might, of course, see the shifts. So when we talk about the annual reporting being, being important, we know that you know, there may come an opportunity where there's grant funding that can move a priority forward, or we might see a shifting you know, funding stream that would, would slow a priority as well. So, so our goal is that we would give that to you in the priority investment section, and it, they would also be reflected in each of the recommendations, but then also that we know that those things may, may shift a little bit as we move forward. So just a reminder, the Amplify Columbia process is also kind of reaching its culmination. So they will be scheduling kind of a, a celebration or public meeting in the near future. And then we'd like to bring that to you all as a final presentation as well. Um, and just, I wanted to kind of close with one of the reasons that um, we really tried to make this as accessible as possible and as, as full of public engagement as possible. We want Columbia to Compass to be a tool, not just for you guys, not just for staff, but also for the citizens. So we want folks to stay engaged. We want people to be able to um, help move it forward because we recognize that those partnerships are, are gonna be critical. We've also really tried to dovetail the process with the Envision Columbia focus areas and vision statements. So we've really focused on how we can bring them back to, to help you all move forward the priorities you've set for the city. Um, and and we hope that that, along with the annual reporting we provide you all with, will be helpful in moving this forward. Now, the identifiable areas that you all have already been in, it's 29203, 5, 1, well, so we've, we've, we've been met throughout the city because it is, it is the comprehensive plan, but we, um, when we had the surveys back, we had the highest participation in 29201 and 29205, and I can't think of the numbers for the second survey off the top of my head right now, but I, I wanna say just because we had 400 people take a survey in one zip code, it didn't mean that we only had two in the other, it was more like we had two to 300 in the other, but those were kind of our peaks. Um, we had about 1,800 folks take the second survey, so it was pretty good participation for us. Procedural, so Friday's the cutoff for the comments. Mm -hmm. Then, what's the time frame from there of you having those comments and we kind of get a draft? Because I was reading over it last night and there were several items in there that at the appropriate time, I think we ought to talk about the wording of uh, that would really enhance it, I think, to make it a better product. And, and, you know, so I guess I'm trying to understand from your folks' time frame when the appropriate time is to, to provide you some of the input based on I would say now okay. um, or you know in the, in the days to come I know for example when we met with you you provided some comments about showing that short term and like yeah. like so we, we're incorporating that in the revisions but we will post those all at once um, in advance of, 
of planning commissions. So we'd ideally like to incorporate all of those comments before we post in advance of planning commission. And um, what is that date? March. It's March second, but logistically for us, <coughs> so if we send something like now and Monday with that. That would be totally cool. Well, I was just take the document and just write a couple yeah. notes on it. Like the little things we had this discussion the other day about economic development on meeting, you know, we, we were pretty good recession for the community. And that, that's not in there. And the economic, I think it's, the, it's those type of things that I think enhance the document that y'all work on. Sure, yeah, that would be great. And some of those things, for example, it's not in the main chapter because we for something like that, that might be more of an existing condition. We could delve into it a little bit more deeply in the appendices for the existing conditions because we're trying to provide that kind of short snapshot. Right. Mm -hmm. But that would that would be great um, because what, once we have it, we'll be um, kind of working furiously to get those comments in, and then we need to actually get them back to um, our traffic design team to be able to package them into books so all my page numbers are right. That sort of thing. So we're um, I, I think Monday would be lovely. Um, I, we, you know, Monday. <laughs> 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 um, you know, and, that, and that's not to say we can't, you know, if something comes up and we absolutely need to, but I think if it's something we can address now, we'd rather address it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Some of the comments we, we, we were working on something yesterday and getting comments from other professionals that were looking at, hey, if you're, if you're using this, why not really use these enhancements that really reflect? So I think there's just a couple spots I noticed the last night when I was reading through it um, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, sure. And we um, and we are you know probably the next question is have we gotten any comments from the public yet? We do have. So yeah. we've gotten a lot. Yes. Well, I well I mean I guess just on the draft itself. So we, we got some great <coughs> feedback at the public meeting, um, and you can actually see what they provided because we we posted the little posters where they stuck their sticky dots up there. But we also. Um, have gotten some comments in the interim, like folks have sent emails and said, you know, it would be great to include this, that sort of thing. So we're already starting to work in those comments we've received. So um, a lot of the comments are a little bit broader, like, you know, we, we're really excited about this recommendation and we think this is great, but we're getting a few that are a little bit more formative that we can try and discuss. Well, yeah, we'll share one comment I've got, I've gotten more than once, is that um, a lot of times what we produce is is more you know, governmental language, and they said it's very easy to read, it's very comprehensive, so I think that we've done a good job of making sure that no matter who it is, can read it and digest it and understand, and it's not like we're that's, that's good to hear. We don't always do a good job. <laughs> um, and so our goal will be once it goes to um, planning commission, I'll come to you all um, probably April 7th. So that it's not at a regular um, zoning public hearing when you just have a clear and full agenda, right? And then, um, and then of course, you hold the public hearing for the first and second reading. Um, but that's, I mean, that's really what I have to share with y'all today. And um, just a thank you guys for your support. And then I'll, I'd really like to get y'all kind of dig in with your questions um, with, with Leanne and Jonathan, but also um, just. In between now and then, it will be helpful for us to return and talk about specific topics in more depth. We can do that as well. We'll be really just focusing on the housing and transportation. You have done yeoman's work. You really have. Uh, you have very intentional, very structured, very inclusive, and I uh, appreciate it. Well, without further ado, I'll give you over to the third lead of the day. <laughs> My apologies, I don't have any phoenixes or waves or <laughs> stars. Sure, you did. Sure, you did. But hopefully, it will be informative and interesting for you. So, um, again, my name is Leanne King. I'm with Clarion Associates, and, and our team is leading the development of the housing element of the comprehensive plan. And so, what I'm going to be sharing today is um, just the highlights um, of the housing market assessment that was conducted at the beginning of this process that really helped us understand what's what are the conditions within this community relative to your local housing market. Um, and comparing that to the broader kind of metropolitan area as well. Um, we couple that with a lot of engagement. Um, Link has done a great job of highlighting that for you. Um, on the housing side, the way we could have augmented that was by meeting with stakeholder groups throughout the process, the planning commission. 
um, we met with them two rounds, one to kind of get their input initially about the issues and concerns and aspirations they have for the community, and then to test those ideas once we've had a time to digest and kind of um, think about those. So we, um, those form the guiding principles for the plan, and really those market trends and guiding principles were then taken to develop the implementation recommendations which were incorporated in the plan. So I'm happy to take questions as we work through this. Again, I'm gonna hit the highlights on the housing market trends. Um, there were three main uh, takeaways that we wanted to kind of highlight for you today. And the first one is, and, and I should say, we were looking at 2000 to 2016 data, um, ACS data. We did use some local um, market sales data as well as part of this assessment. Um, so the three key takeaways are, one, rental prices and home values are rising faster than incomes. That's probably not new news to you. Um, second, there's an unmet demand for uh, a mix of housing types, and we've got some graphics to um, illustrate that. And finally, there's a gap in affordability for extremely low income renters, and affordability will likely continue to decline based on some of the analysis. So we have these so these are not unique. unique to the coin year. These are the, That's right. <laughs> well, these are, these are, these are, Definitely not unique to Columbia. I think the majority of communities that we work with then are dealing with these right. same issues. Well, um, I, I, I would say that you have to add in to us that because of the tax structure, the rental prices are continuing. Two years ago, it was three months worth of collection to cover the property tax. Now it's three and a half months. So I think it has a direct effect. Um, for us here, a little more uniquely than others, but a lot of the aspects you are correct. But you know that does affect because we have 52% rentals in Columbia for home ownership, which is you know the, we've been really pushing to try to That's right. get over that hump. Okay. I think it serves to keep us uh, thinking creatively on how we can make this happen, but at the same time, uh, it, it does not cost us a certain, you know, right. Right. population as well as uh, certain areas of the city, their ability to um, be as successful as others in terms of amenities, in terms of fashion, and, and that sort of thing. It goes hand in hand, other than that. These are fun balancing acts. Right, we're, and we're, we're making some of the mistakes. <coughs> we don't want to make the mistake a lot of other cities have, have made. We're trying to get to this point. That's right. And I think that oh. you are at a unique standpoint in comparison to other cities because I think you can kind of see and learn from a lot of other communities and what they've done and learn from their shortfalls. Um, so I think that's an important point. And learn from the cities to impress them. I think the key point of this being part of when the conference is yeah, they may not be unique to other cities, but there are other cities that are being very aggressive and innovative in addressing the needs, and that's where we really need to use that to guide our policy making and some of the things that we do. And there's some of those case studies included within the, the grab chapter that kind of highlights some of the tools that we're working on. Um, so this slide <coughs> compares, and again, this is that same um, kind of 1999 to 2016 time frame. But it shows those market trends. Um, the first slide being the median income and how there was a percent change of 38% over that time frame. When you compare that to the median rent and the median home values, they're, they're, you know, they're not in alignment. So median rent rose 59%, median home value, and those are kind of stated home values by homeowners, uh, was 67%. Median sales price was about equivalent, which you would somewhat expect to see given that people can only afford to buy so much housing. But with the, the values and the rents are actually increasing pretty significantly, more so than the incomes during that time. Yeah, right. In the, um, the, the, the market where you, you had you know, the increase of 67%, is some of that value, are you using the, the property tax as your basis for that number? Is yeah. some of that, just because of the continuing assessments that are going on and stuff, is that part of that equation? Is that what we're seeing? So that's likely some of that. It's actually based on the homeowner's value right. of their property, and so they're probably taking into account what they know they're being assessed that's, for, and that that's the know, assessment's probably a good baseline, right? And have that relationship to fair market value, you know, 
somewhat of a judgment call. Um, sales price, you know, is only the certain sector that's actually on the market and being sold, so that only tells us so much, so it's helpful to augment that with the actual value of the property. Going back to Mr. Rickman's point about rent and the impact of rent. The baseline there is 99, and you go to 2016 and 2008, 2007, we had Act 388, which moved the rental taxes up substantially. I, I would say that if you took the tax impact out of that 59%, you'd get closer, much closer to the median sale price of 35% and median income of 38%. The state legislature, with Act 388, screwed up to rents. It's a great place to retire, it's just a bad place to rent. That's right. Um, looking at your housing stock, and I think you mentioned a statistic of 52%, was that probably a more um, concurrent number? These are, again, based on 2016 data points. Um, but the majority of your um, the folks living in unit housing units within Columbia are renters in comparison to the MSA, which is the Metropolitan Statistical Area, the larger region for, that Columbia sits within, which is roughly about a third of that population are renters. Um, and um, one thing I did want to mention is that when we looked at this, we looked at age cohorts because we know there's a student population here that, that are renting. They're not all owning homes. Um, but what we found was that, that across the age cohorts, there was kind of a higher percentage of renters in comparison to the broader MSA. Um, and uh, in general, this is also no surprise, you have some amazing historic um, properties within Columbia, and on average, your housing stock's a little bit older than some, some of the surrounding areas that are more newly developed. Um, when you look at the actual housing stock and how that breaks down, um, this, this top pie chart here shows you all the units within. So you've got 42,255 units, and about a little more than half of those are single-family detached units. About a quarter are attached, fewer than 10 in a structure, and um, slightly less than a quarter are attached 10 or more in a structure, so more of like an apartment building, and a slight um, uh, piece there for mobile homes. When you look at, um, compare that to kind of who's living within those units, when you look at owner-occupied units, um, about 91% of owner-occupied units are single-family attached with a little less than 10% um, divided up between the other categories. When you look at renters, again, that, you know, 55% of um, folks living within the city are in this category. You see much more variety in terms of the types of housing that they're living in. Um, and the majority are not single-family attached. They're one of the other kind of products that you will find them living in. Um, so you talked, uh, you know, about rental trends, and this is something that we looked at as well, and that, that changed between 2000 and 2016, and I think that to your point, you know, the, the state made some adjustments that have had a significant impact on rental rates within Columbia. Um, when we look particularly at the low end, um, the less than 500, you know, that that changed, there were 43% of units, rental units in 2000 that were less than $500. Um, fast forward to 2016, and you've got 13% of the rental units within that category. So that was a, a pretty significant difference, and you can kind of see how the columns have changed um, over time in the various categories. Um, not quite as dramatic, but similar type of trend for home value, looking at the different um, um, values of homes, um, and we again looking at kind of the lower end, the less than hundred thousand uh, dollar category. Um, uh, obviously, we've been in kind of a, a booming time in terms of um, housing prices. Uh, back in two thousand, over fifty percent of your housing was less than hundred thousand dollars in terms of that home value. Um, two thousand sixteen, we're looking at slightly less than a quarter of those um, units within that category. So. So there's a little bit of a mismatch, and again, this is not unique to Columbia. This is a common trend that we're seeing um, throughout the United States, particularly in kind of um, great areas that people want to be living in. Um, we looked at market trends, actual kind of sales data within the city of Columbia and the metro area um, to see you know, what's being sold, and this is for year 2018. 
Um, no surprise, the vast majority of homes for the city that were um, on the market and sold were single family detached homes. Um, an interesting point when we looked at the data, we actually looked at the days on the market, and what we found is that patio homes that you'll see highlighted there in that the red um, boundary for both the city and for the metro area stayed on the market not as much time. It's, there was some suggestion that maybe this is a product that more people would like to have and that there's interest in having a variety of products out there that may be unmet today. Um, we also looked at affordability. So looking at, this is specific to renters, um, looking at the various income ranges that renters fall within, what um, rent amount is affordable to those incomes, and then how many units are rented within that affordability uh, range. And what we found was that there's a rental gap, and this is one of those top three takeaways that I mentioned on that first slide, that roughly um, folks earning less than $20,000 a year, there's kind of a gap in the, the properties that are available. Those, those That's a significant rented. gap. Yeah. yeah. And it's 36% of the um, rental population is within that category. So it's, um, you know, that's, that's significant. So. Um, we also, again, starting with 2016 numbers, did a forecast for 10 years ahead, um, no crystal ball, but you know, I, I think you know, good analysis based on trends of what we think we might um, be experiencing over the next several years in terms of affordability challenges. Um, looking at both owner affordability and rental affordability. And um, similar to what you saw on the last slide, um, you know, both for um, the rental and ownership, um, folks on the, the low end earning less than $35,000 a year, it's anticipated that percent of homes that are affordable to those um, households who are earning those incomes is likely gonna decline over time. Um, so, so we've got affordability challenge. Again, nothing, but not unique in, in any respect to Columbia or the region. Um, like this, is, this is happening throughout the United States. Um, so yeah. that's the data part. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, a few slides back. Um, go back. Survey when we survey demographically the region, the city. Is that consistent with all parties included? So there's a map that's actually in the plan and, and in this housing market study that just it shows um, the average rental rates for different, uh, I believe it's census tract, I can't remember the exact geography that we used for it, but it so shows a spatial distribution of median rates for these different geographies that census provides. And there are distinctions. So there are definitely places where the median rent is higher than in other places, and that is mapped in the plan. And the so that, that is mapped? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. It'd be interesting to look at that. Yeah. So this is that, go, is that included? It's, yeah, I believe that map is actually in the plan and it's also in this housing market stuff okay. that's on the Good. website Good. as well. So Good. I'm sure we can yeah, get that for you. <laughs> Um, likewise, we also looked at the spatial distribution of housing values. Um, the maps are slightly different. Um, those are by dots because they're pinpoint of actual units and what their values are. It, which brings up a question because we had some interesting conversations, I think you and I did, about a year ago where people were complaining that their properties weren't assessed. Mm -hmm. They were under-assessed in value, which has a it's tough because it creates more tax, but right. you know, from the value standpoint, and I'm curious if y'all ran across some discrepancies in assessed values as y'all were 
kind of looking at the broader picture? Well, we didn't we didn't do a direct comparison with okay. um, for one that census data won't necessarily let us get to that level to do the one to one comparison. They kind of aggregate the data for okay. our community's sake. Um, but that's I mean that's a challenge in looking at home value is it's based on that person's understanding of what their homes worth. So. Especially in a, in a market like this, um, sometimes it can be elevated beyond what right. it actually is. And some under. And some under. It, it depends on the, the assessment year. So if your house was assessed or you purchased your house during the recession, it's at that point, and the, the assessment only happens every five years. So in a five-year period, that can be quite an influx. So if you, can, if, you, if you hit that assessment at a certain point, you're going to be low, or if you hit it high, and then there's a dip, well then all of a sudden you're up high. So it has, it has that, that five year window. It's a pretty big window based on a market changing. Yeah. So again, the guiding principles for the plan, we have five of them for this housing element, um, were very much um, developed using the inputs that we received from the public, from the stakeholders, from the planning commission that we met with. And in terms of stakeholder groups, we met with a variety of different folks that are interested in housing and neighborhoods in the city. Um, we met with affordable housing advocates and developers, real estate interests, neighborhood sort of preservation interests, um, folks that are working on kind of transitional and emergency housing. So a lot of different um, folks were kind of were met with during this process to um, get their insights and, and concerns for the for the future of Columbia with respect to housing and neighborhoods. And so we took all of that information and we generated these five guiding principles and the, the element actually has more language that describes specifically what we mean by each of these. Um, but they are walkable and vibrant neighborhoods. That that's something that we're um, trying to achieve. Uh, the enhancement and stabilization of underserved neighborhoods, protection of historical and cultural characteristics, affordable housing, and mix of housing and neighborhood choices. So those were the, really the five key things that kept rising to the top as we moved through this process. And so what, what I've got here is just a, a, a quick summary of the implementation recommendations under those five guiding principles that we set out. So in terms of walkable and vibrant neighborhoods, there's a lot of overlap with some of the stuff that you'll see in the land use element and the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. It's the beauty of comprehensive planning is all this stuff feeds into each other, so you get to decide exactly where it's going to go. But we wanted to call this out in this chapter because we thought it was important to think about a full and complete neighborhood and this idea that as your neighborhoods redevelop and revitalize over time, you want to think about all the components that make a complete neighborhood, um, sidewalks, lighting, um, having access to parks, um, potentially trails, um, if there are maybe local services that are within a short commuting distance that they can use for daily needs, those types of things, um, schools, those make complete neighborhoods. And so there's some recommendations in there for how to go about evaluating that over time and trying to encourage that as, again, as, as neighborhoods redevelop and change in the future. In terms of enhancement and stabilization of underserved neighborhoods, underserved neighborhoods, excuse me, um, we had a couple of recommendations. The first one was for um, departments within the city and agencies outside of the city that work to um, assist um, these underserved neighborhoods to be collaborating because there's some efficiencies and maybe some um, some other opportunities to be kind of coordinate, having better coordination um, of different efforts. Uh, secondly, ongoing neighborhood <coughs> assistance. We've learned from kind of watching what other communities have done with respect to how do we revitalize an underserved neighborhood without displacing the people that live there. And it's a challenging thing to do. And one of the one of the best ways to, to go about achieving that is having ongoing neighborhood assistance and really creating an, a community dialogue within that neighborhood about what they want to be and how having those members of the community involved in that discussion is particularly challenging for renters who don't actually own the property that they are, are living within. So would you say <coughs> one and two kind of collectively need to be done together because yes. you need mm -hmm. to. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Creating some efficiency and some focus among all the different organizations that are working on these issues and then making sure that the community is part of that dialogue. Um, both folks that live there and the landowners that own the land and make decisions about change in the community. So that's important. Been, that inevitably becomes a part of the narrative with uh, community organizations mm -hmm. and them collaborating. 
there's been much conversation about gentrification and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, gentrification as opposed to community development. Right. Um, how do we how do we get that word out to community organizations? I'm sure all of us become a conduit for that. Mm -hmm. But how do you how do you deal with that emphasis within the community where it's not gentrification but community development? Right. I think to some degree, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think well, it's we, not. Yeah, I think we've learned from other communities. Um, I'm thinking that we've got a <coughs> here in Boston. It's a scattered one. Yeah, 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 California has some communities that have really dealt with this. <coughs> I think that the more that you can foster a sense of stewardship and kind of, um, you know, um, sense of place within that community, and um, I think stewardship's a good way to describe it, that as a um, a landowner, you are part of that community and you want to be invested and involved with the people that live there as well and thinking about the future and how that change occurs. Mm -hmm. From a government standpoint, you want to be looking at um, the types of investments that are going to help that community without pushing them out. And that's a delicate balance to make. <laughs> Very delicate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, um, so I, I think that, like I said, the ongoing, the, the idea behind the ongoing neighborhood assistance is that you're continually looking and talking about this stuff and watching as trends start to occur so that if you, if you do see people being displaced and if that is something that is starting to occur, how can you respond to it and making sure you're having a dialogue about that. I think that that's, that's really a, a key it sounds part like of it. To me, you know, part, part of that is making sure that we keep people invested. I mean, mm -hmm. you got to have... It can't be all assistance from outside. It's got to be assistance so inside. inside. Yeah, you got to have skin in the game, and, right. and so helping people make sure they can leverage that. And you know, like anything, it, all it takes is one or two, three, and then it starts to spread, and everybody comes together. I think those are some good points. Oh, same thing. Um, I think it's going to be incumbent upon us as a city to uh, make sure that we do engage. People who live within a certain area that may be um, uh, just about to go to, to that process. Um, stakeholders, main, uh, mainly people who live within the area, yes. versus uh, um, assistance from elsewhere that really doesn't have a history there. And, and that's where the conflict comes in. We, as a city, can, uh, I, I think, go about this and not make the mistakes other, you know, the other cities have made by honestly and truly engaging people who live in an area. Investment, investments from within, but at the same time, helping them to develop the tools to, uh, to be creative, to be creative and, and stabilize you know, their own situation. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how you move, uh, everybody benefits. But it's not difficult to tell when people are not benefiting from what we're doing. Yeah. A lot of work we've done in the city over the last several decades right. before he was um, got here whether it's intentionally or not intentionally, has been really focused on on, on making sure the city is, is diverse. I mean, some of the uh, programs that the Gray, the that Gray's department and others have, have worked on has really helped us retain a number of folks who otherwise would have left the city in a nice middle class and working class uh, community. It's going to require, I mean, the, the flow of capital and the strength of capitals are strong. But it's going to require the same degree of intentionality to make sure we remain the city uh, for all people. It's going to take some systemic, I mean, we've done yeoman's work as a city um, uh, on, on terms of taxes. Uh, you know, it hasn't always been the same uh, with, with some of our, our, our sister uh, our jurisdictions. Just just reality is reality. Uh, and, and we, we now account for less than 20% of the tax burden. Uh, but that, that larger tax burden plays into all these other issues mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, in some creative ways. But it is going to require that intentionality having the, having the community uh, 
as active as, as possible in helping shape what we want this uh, city to look like for the next generation to requires that deserve of intentionality and, and that inclusion. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you. Mr. Mayor, this is a great conversation. We're talking about five more minutes. Okay. Just taking into account the major items. Continue, just continue this dialogue as we move okay. through the process. This, this is, I can get through these, I just have two, three more slides. I'm starting to get through these pretty quickly. So, uh, protection of historical and cultural characteristics, there's also, again, a land use and cultural resources element that have a lot of focus, particularly on this. But we wanted to include this in the idea that the supporting property maintenance is important to think about the historic um, uh, stock of housing within Columbia. Affordable housing, we have several recommendations here. Um, developer incentives, updating your affordable housing locational standards. We actually looked at that as a part of this and thinking about, we had a team member that's worked with the federal government and looking at, uh, and HUD, looking at those standards on a kind of national level, we made some recommendations there. Looking at public land and funding, are there opportunities to leverage some of the resources that you have available for affordable housing? There are other communities that are doing that. We have some case studies included in there. Um, the housing challenge is not um, specific to Columbia, it's regional. You've got people that are moving in and out of your city every day, going to work um, and coming home from work. And so um, it's important to think about this kind of from the larger standpoint of the housing market that's kind of the regional uh, perspective. And their the housing land trust is a really good model that other communities are starting to look to more so as a way to kind of share um, and leverage the resources of different localities and how they can kind of deal with this housing issue on a, on a broader scale. And then transitional housing services are providing some um, opportunities for those that really have the most challenging housing situations within the community. Um, mix of housing and neighborhood choices, while it's um, similar to uh, the issue of affordable housing, it's not necessarily the same thing. And what we're seeing based on the data is that um, you, you probably need a little bit more variety in this community and there's some opportunity to incentivize multi-unit housing within the city, also look for residential care uses, and I mentioned complete neighborhoods um, earlier. So that is the end of my presentation. Right on. Appreciate it. Very much. Good afternoon, Jonathan Gunn. I apologize for not being the fourth lead to speak today. So you can call me a lead if you'd like to. But I'm going to briefly speak about transportation. Um, and I'm going to sort of set the table for the existing conditions, which helps to frame our recommendations and probably uh, projects as we see moving forward. Um, this is a snapshot from 2017 when we looked at this. If you look across the board, you can see primarily here in Columbia, we drive by ourselves. We don't take transit, we don't carpool. Um, although we do have a high propensity for walking, a lot of that is within the city, which is associated not only with the university, but just the connectedness of the city uh, here in the downtown grid that we have, which is a positive as you look across the board in your comparative city with Greenville and Charleston, they fall well below that 20% mark. Um, commuting patterns, uh, you've got about 28,000 commuters who come into the city every day for jobs, whereas you export out 8,500. Um, so you've got a lot of regional mobility occurring. Toll bridge would sure generate some income, would it? <laughs> it absolutely would. That's just Lexington County. County. That is just Lexington County. It's not considered. That's not Fairfield, County. Kershaw, yeah. Newberry, Sumter. Yeah. 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 And uh, having been one of those people who commuted regionally, uh, you have people who commute from North County as well. Uh, so there's a growing demand, uh, as I did that for almost two years before moving here. So a lot of patterns, you're commuting here, there's an attraction here, be it jobs, be it location, um, whatever that might be, you're seeing this attraction that's occurring. Unfortunately, uh, we're not seeing those stay here, and that ties back to what Ian was talking about with housing. Um, you go back on the screen for a second? Absolutely. Yes, sir. That's a really good switch. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, you got to watch your audience, man. You gotta watch I know. <laughs> you got to focus on you guys, and I don't know what I'm saying. Um, street ownership. <laughs> SCDOT is your primary owner. Uh, they are the fourth largest owner of streets in the United States, uh, yet they are one of the smallest states in the United States. They own about 55% of the streets here within the city of Columbia. Uh, they own about 41,000 lane miles within the state of South Carolina. You also have a, uh, a little bit of a split there between the city of Columbia, 25% and 19% with uh, primarily the county and or uh, private local streets in the university. Um, which is uh, which is an interesting model and it helps us 
frame some of the recommendations. And what's more important is actually this, which is going to frame some of our recommendations, and that's safety. Um, and if you watch the trend here, uh, you know that we had almost a thousand fatalities in South Carolina last year. Um, you can see here as we look at the crashes across um, just the city of Columbia, you can see that the majority of those crashes are occurring on U.S. primary routes. Again, going back to the commuting patterns that you're seeing, your 378s, um, your U.S. ones, uh, and then your South Carolina primary routes. Again, those roads that are feeding into those primary routes. And then the interstates being a very, very small percent, even though they carry a huge amount of traffic coming in and out every day. You are at the crossroads of South Carolina, and a lot of people travel through here as well. Is, is it just me, or is it one of seeing like a, a ramp up in the state newspaper recognition of car crashes and traffic jams and the like? I'm seeing a lot of it. Like yeah, every morning. I actually made the same comment to John today. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just me, right? No, that's that's the headlines that get pushed out even through their uh, internet forum and then what's online. That's because well, well, they're headed to the commute from, uh, okay. from yeah. Charlotte and Columbia. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost, um, almost every morning. Yeah, no, it is almost every morning. And, um, well, it's 18 wheelers involved too. So it's yeah. the sign of the economy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 right it's, a, it's a lot of factors that are, that are feeding into that. It's primarily factors that we're one of the deadliest states in the United States with the number of fatalities. Sure. Um, there's a big push with SCDOT through Target Zero to get those down as well as USDOT. Um, and so you're going to see that push. Uh, and that theme is going to carry through this. Um, but as we look at the overall crashes, you can see right here, um, this is the breakdown of the cr top crash, not necessarily the locations, but corridors. You can see Garner's Ferry Road is the number one, uh, followed by some of the interstates, I-77, uh, 26, 20, and then we start to dig down into the, some of the more local streets here. I noticed um, under your primary causes, you don't have potholes and infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's right. actually... Um, Which well, is where you, if you listen to some of those reports, it's like a lot of those people are are dodging and trying to get over yeah. all the patchwork and everything. For the, the, the land use, or excuse me, not land use, but for the categories that are provided from the uh, Department of Public Safety, uh, unfortunately, road conditions is not one of those, but you do see some of that. I think that's by showing design. Up. <laughs> Could be, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it's not tied to uh, SCDOT who's responsible for that. But what you actually do see, that does show up when you look at side swipes, which is number three. Um, your top primary cause, though, is speeding. We love to drive fast here in South Carolina, um, and that uh, is indicative of a couple things. One, just a um, just the propensity of us to do that, but also the design of the roadways too. Um, and we'll dig into that a little bit. But the overall primary crashes um, is property damage only. Injury crashes uh, takes up about uh, another third of that, and then fatalities. There were 20 fatalities. All of those occurred within the city. Um, of Columbia, those were within the Richland County portion of the city. Mm. So, one of the things I talked about, the, the primary causes, um, the way to help curb that is through good design. design. And so one of the things that we look at here is putting together um, a street priority matrix. You can see here we've got a snippet of that just for the downtown. And this actually helps to provide guidance on where the design speed should be. Depending on the street types, you can see the street typology over here, whether it's uh, major arterials, minor collectors, or local. This helps to frame how the street should be. And accommodations there, some of the others that um, I don't have listed here, but you've got the urban core, the edge, uh, rural areas, and then of course multimodal facilities are also important. And all of these capture in what the priority mode should be for that street, whether at this point it should be the movement of buses, it should be the movement of pedestrians or bicyclists, or it should be cars. This will help to define that. You can see that from the travel way through the pedestrian zone. And there's other elements that are important, like access management. If we look at, if we go back to Garner's Ferry Road, access management would help a lot with crashes along that course. Is access management what they So access management is a good question. Access management is um, looking at consolidation of driveways, connectivity between, giving people the option of going between or connecting the side streets without getting back on 378 make a small trail or pull out, make a right, and make another left. And you could have done that um, a couple other ways. It just increases the safety. You're going to see some recommendations here before I get into the priorities. And each of these fall under these themes. You can see it here. This is plan and implement. And one of those that I think is a very fitting uh, example of how to, to deal with the, the high level of crashes that are occurring within the city is developing 
uh, street design manual. We showed portions of this with the street priority matrix. Again, the quickest way to do it is enforcement. The best way to do it is through design and changing how your streets interact. Accommodation for all modes, bicycles, pedestrians, cars, controlling the speed along there. You can go in and change your speed limit from 45 to 25 and you're still going to come back and your 85th percentile speed is going to be 50 miles per hour. If you don't change how it feels, you don't get that. But then also developing prioritization of projects by type um, and then adopting the official street typology map, which I showed on the so previous. For us, that's a challenge. When we look at the places that we like to put a bump out to slow down traffic, because a three-way stop doesn't work, because somebody looks and they oh, nobody there, yeah. they dark through <coughs> in a highly traffic neighborhood, but we can't seem to get the highway department to work with us, even if we're willing to pay it. So yeah. How, how, do we do, how do we do that in those areas? I mean, yeah. what if folks doing in other areas to encourage better interagency workings? Because that's one of our struggles, especially at 55% of the roads we don't control. Correct. And what you're seeing a lot of agencies do is they are moving to the ownership of the streets. I talked about South Carolina having over 41,000 miles of streets. There are only streets they shouldn't own. There are only streets within cities. Their primary function is the movement of cars uh, along the interstate. And unfortunately, uh, they got in the business of owning neighborhood streets that they really shouldn't and they don't have control over, or downtown streets where the blend was the idea is not necessarily to move cars, but also to move people. Uh, and they struggle with that because their design manual doesn't have a chapter that says, how do I deal with pedestrians? And so you have to find that balance. They're getting better. They're not great yet. They're still adopting new guidelines as we move forward. You're seeing ASHTO, uh, which is sort of the the governing body for highway and transportation officials that are adopting low speed urban guidelines. Uh, the advanced copy that I've seen through SCDOT is starting to show more areas for that. But in locations like a, a neighborhood, the best and quickest way we've seen is for street, is for communities to take those streets back and control those streets. It's a financial burden to the city to do that. Are you seeing other municipalities do that? Yeah. And in South Carolina. In South Carolina. And DOT is willing to well, yeah, DOT will hand you as many streets as you want. Right we're actually Correct. at the tail end of negotiating. Okay. Okay. Is it the 55% coming back our way? Or Not all of them, but we could have got it. I think you could have to be strategic. I you do. It do and really do. And I'm what I will tell you is even if, let's say you wanted to take over, um, you know, uh, Lawrence Ferry Road, which is mm -hmm. you know, 378. They're not going to let you because it's a U.S. primary route. They're still going to want to make it. But as they come through downtown, there's ways to work with them. Our the staff has done a great, a great job. They hands have. on, 20,000 feet, but also very granular. I mean, it's been, it is a, it is a process. So to take over, to take over the streets, you know, one thing, especially if they're not providing, then we need that portion of funding that they're collecting yeah. for that. But the other thing is that we have to have the ability to enforce it. We can't put an officer on every street. You're right. Because the reality is, is when we do enforcement in a neighborhood, Chief Kelly, 80% of them are people who live in the neighborhood who end up getting tickets. Somewhere in there. A lot. So speed, speed cameras and things yeah. like that that other communities utilize, we can't utilize, and so for for us, we need we need those options because we can't afford to put an officer on every corner. It's just yeah. not possible. And you don't get long-term compliance when you do enforcement. You may get immediate drops that you know the time period that they're out there, but long-term people get back to their habits. Mm -hmm. That's why I state that design is what actually solves the issue. So it's an more expensive. example of design where yeah. the DOT has come to the table with us, and our John and Krista and all of them are doing a great job of community outreach that we as the city are taking on. It is a DOT project, but Millwood, so be ready because this is an example that's about to go online um, very soon with the traffic calming. No lane reduction, but the, the lanes will be shrunk, I guess, for lack of a better way to explain it. You're about to hear about a lot of outreach that we're going to try to do. Is that, that a community more. meeting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the comment I was going to make to Daniel's point. Yeah, DOT, but the other challenge is that the community, when you do stuff that slows down traffic, <coughs> i.e., bike lane or you know, show traffic comment, you know, you get people not liking it. But that is how you do this through the time, and we've got to be committed to that long-term, you know, benefit, even if there's some short-term angst of people getting used to it. It was a perfect segue for a project that y'all are probably going to hear about here pretty soon. 
But I think the outreach is very well done and um, and it's staged. So the bike lanes that the DOT came and said, hey, we're, we're doing in reprocessment. We're going to be paving either way. Do you want to do shrink the load and put on put the bike lanes on the side? So we're saying yes. <laughs> but that's a perfect example of, of partnership um, that accomplishes the goals. One of the other things was safety, targeted safety improvements for all modes, um, and then adopting city standards to encourage traffic calming where appropriate, and then adopting the vision zero plan, which is uh, very important for the state of South Carolina to, uh, to reduce the overall fatality rate, not only here, uh, but across the state. And then partnerships, which could be better time of year, but uh, partnering on broader regional transportation projects, whether it's a regional rail, uh, commuter rail throughout the state, or larger projects such as um, Carolina's Crossroads, um, and then targeted street ownership, we talked about that already, and then railroad projects, which is uh, which I could spend another hour talking about the importance of that um, and how that impacts the community on overall uh, mobility, but that is something that is important to the residents that live here, and we did hear quite a bit of that uh, in our outreach with the community. Uh, innovation and technology, we can't escape this. We are changing, we're evolving, and where we're going in the future, and everything's getting more and more connected, and you cannot drive your car without your car talking back to you and connected <laughs> in a completely different way than it used to be. Uh, you're already seeing signs of that. I'll applaud the city on their advancements and coordination with uh, SCDOT and other providers as we already start to have small cell technology on a lot of our traffic signal poles here. Um, but creating that connected signal system, which is partially under the way at this point right now, um, and then leveraging shared mobility options, which is something that a lot of communities struggle with. We're seeing ordinances pop up uh, about scooters and things like that, but be open-minded, look at the options, evaluate it in what makes the most sense for the community, uh, and then plan for the impacts of technology because it's coming faster than we want to think uh, it's going to be here. Uh, and then data, um, again, uh, in the transportation world, we love data. It helps us to prioritize projects. That is one of the things that I would stress the most is prioritization of transportation projects, which I'll mention a few here in a few minutes, uh, and then a parking study. Uh, for the many years that I have lived here, we always hear about parking. There's not enough parking. There's too much parking. It's in the wrong place. Uh, using data to define where that might be and how we can use that and better leverage that, not only from just a supply and demand, but also from a revenue source would be uh, a recommendation for us. Uh, and then lead by example. Designing larger scale projects. We heard a lot of the community talk about comprehensive plans, looking at how streets can be better, utilizing the street. It's one of the largest public spaces that any city has. Uh, streets should be great. They should be designed to accommodate all modes that are not just a singular mode. Uh, and then lastly, the build environment. Um, looking at context and developing neighborhood traffic control pilot project programs, whatever it might be small things, there's things you can do with paved markings, there's things that you can do to drastically change with not a whole lot of money, and SCDOT will partner with you on that. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, you guys in the city of Columbia are the crossroads in South Carolina. You've got three main interstates coming through here, uh, which is really an interesting thing, really four if you count 126. Um, and so you are the crossroads. So creating those gateways, whether they're regional, whether they're local, those signature places that identify where uh, Columbia is and that you are in Columbia is a priority. We heard this uh, in our outreach as well. Um, and then some of the priority projects that we've got, corridor enhancements we'll see again, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. We grouped each of these streets looking at priorities that we heard or those that we recommended uh, and pulling in from some other plans as well. You can see here some of these are going to are really complex. Some of these are not. Um, but it's important for these corridor enhancements for these to move forward, and this gives us a sort of a, a test, if you will, to see how well we can implement these. Um, corridor operation projects, we've heard a lot about synchronized timings through here, uh, and improving traffic flow as well, small safety projects. You can see an example over there at Harbison, uh, Bowner Park Terrace, a realignment there. That small change right there would make a tremendous difference on how traffic would flow through that area, which is one of the the most congested places that we see. Uh, and then lastly, uh, intersection improvement projects. You know, one more after this, uh, but targeted. Some of these are already underway. Some of these are moving forward, but a lot of these will make a huge impact on overall mobility, not just for the motor vehicle, but also from a uh, pedestrian and bicycle standpoint. And then lastly, some of the other projects, <coughs> rail consolidation, improving rail crossing, uh, and then again, access management as it relates to the number of crossings. 
uh, and then quiet zones. And that's all that I have. Any questions? Railroad safety zones. We don't use the word quiet because it makes the railroad cry. So Okay. Safety zones. <coughs> question, question, this might be a leap question, but um, I, I know it when I read it, I saw something about sidewalks, but John, you didn't really talk about sidewalks. Where is that in the plan as far as understanding where we are? No, that, that is a great question. Um, and we mentioned this as she was starting off and kind of giving an overview. Um, this really builds upon uh, the wall bike club plan. And so all those recommendations that were in that plan, which was much more exhaustive and thorough, filters directly into this plan. So we carry those recommendations in. I didn't get into detail on that because we had spent a lot of time with that, but those do carry completely over. And we do have a recommendation in there about um, targeted maintenance for all modes. So one of the things that we heard from the departments as we were talking to the public is not just about you know, creating new things, but making sure that we're doing that maintenance, whether it's roadway maintenance or sidewalk maintenance, um, bike lane maintenance, all of these things, all of these things that make it important thinking about how we're putting aside that budget. Because we we'll definitely make sure even the, just the addition, because more people can walk, they have safer places to walk, so not having sidewalks mm -hmm. is, a, is a barrier for people to make sure we get around and get out of those single family, uh, single driven cars. Yeah, it is. We've um, we, we made headway in the last few years in terms of the new developments. Um, the engineering standards require sidewalks and so those sidewalks and new developments. It's really those existing neighborhoods that um, at the time it wasn't popular to have sidewalks. Are you going to promote variant power lines in your recommendation? <laughs> That's actually a recommendation of the natural resources section is to look at a undergrounding plan. So looking at kind of that planning process for key corridors. So that's um, not part of transportation, but just a little bit. You know, like Leanne said, I'm going to ask that question. It's hard. Neighborhood uh, planning presentation. Yeah. As new no. sidewalks come along. Yeah. So it, it, <laughs> looking at that, one of the things that we recommend is it, it's looking. We've got some case studies in there about what other communities are doing. But um, some communities, like Greenville, for example, are just basically burying their lines whenever there's new development. And that can be a little bit more difficult for us. Greenville's a little bit more compact, right? So we don't want it, we want to do it a little bit more strategically. So the recommendation is to look at um, a plan towards implementation and whether we could do that in a regulatory or a franchise fee or what have you. Any project, any updates on Bull and
sort of where we are and what's to come in a schedule that we're looking at. So what we're talking a little bit about today, um, if, you, if you're getting a copy of the presentation, it may be loaded as well. Um, if Ms. Ms. Cannon can load it for us on the... So part of what we're talking about are budget drivers and maybe discussion topics, um, things that we will be bringing to council in more detail or the things that you will already have in more detail in the conversation about. So the budget capacity, um, the first item, um, what that's really getting to is where we are with regards to our budget capacity, mostly as it relates to the general fund. Um, in regards to the, uh, it's on the just even the from that from so the budget, um, as you recall, we do budget the general fund. Um, it is reflective of a, we incorporate surplus as part of that budget. In years past, we have been trying to wean ourselves from that budget, using the budget surplus um, to balance the budget with. So we will, of course, start with the budget that with the same um, goal. Um, however, between now and the time we pass the budget, that, that could be a different story. Um, budget additions are those things that we talk about throughout the year, um, things that we that council or um, staff has talked about adding to the budget or would be um, things to consider that would be adding. But also those things that are out of our control. For instance, state retirement is another increase coming up um, this year, 1%. Um, we also have adjusted uh, our health care costs in anticipation of the um, experience rate being applied to us now that we are going into our um, this will be coming up our third year in the uh, state health plan, state health plan. Under revenue generations, um, some, some of those items are obviously underway um, that you are aware of, the tax exempt study. Um, where that's coming into play is that as you consider the model ordinance and as we're looking at adapting model ordinance changes, that is reflective of the elimination of the nonprofit exemption that we currently have. So they incorporate some of those items together. Um, fire hydrant fee, you've already approved. Those are reflected, those will be reflected in the budget. Of course, those are yeah. revenues are applied towards ongoing um, expenses um, in the general fund. Business license enhanced, that is also underway. The business license enhanced enforcement, that is underway. Um, so far, it's seeing good progress. Uh, good product, so I hope to have more information on that as we move along through the process as well. Um, and then some negotiations with with uh, fees with certain entities. Some of that gets to some of the nonprofit organizations that we've discussed that are obviously sharing in the services that the city provides, um, however, are not contributing with regards to property taxes and as we've discussed in prior years in terms of distributing our tax base or the cost of our services across our tax base. This would be one, one method of which we would do that. No, sir, they are down today, so that's mm -hmm. what he's filming. Okay, okay. Yes, that's why he's back. No, they just, they just, yeah, he came in and they, they, were, mm -hmm. okay. they weren't working, unfortunately, this morning. So, so it's, it is streaming? Oh. It is not streaming. Mm -hmm. It'll be available? Yeah, there's a there's a note online why it's not streaming, okay. but we'll make it. I apologize, we'll get a note of that earlier. Okay. No, I didn't, I okay. should have. Okay. Um, Missy, I, I think the bullets here under revenue generation was really to kind of recap for you all a lot of good hard work that's been done over the last year, data collection, figuring the study, implementing the study, not sure over time, but <coughs> the study as far as when we'll have some uh, additional but Just, just but for clarification, it's not uh, just a tax exempt study, it's an overall tax of looking at all the different components of what makes up our property tax so that we can truly take a look at it. Again, just uh, and obviously we require the participation of the school districts and, um, and the county, but I mean, commission uh, a group to take a look at the overall tax structure. And, and, and I mean, I mean, overall tax structure. Report, that gives them the basis to yeah. work off of. Well, well, yeah. Because well, we, 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 we got a pretty good sense as we as we evolve. I'm well, talking about systemic responses to it. How we're going to deal with it as a, uh, as a as a region. Well, I think I think part of our purpose of doing this, Mr. Mayor, is that we have have that so that we can 
truly look at it so that we can pull that group together and get the responses because you know tax exempt property is a portion of it but we also got these other agencies that aren't capped that are continuing to grow without any accountability or ability for us to slow down and, and you know passing referendums saying they're one price and then their net price is a whole other ball game so i think it'd be good for us to have the data oh, no, so, so we can I we can do that but i agree with you i think I, we do need I, to have our that. challenges our challenges i think just want to tackle this systemic challenge sooner rather than later uh, we, we we led on it but i think there's so much more we all need to be doing I mean, obviously we, we represent with 17 cents on the dollar now. Yeah. Yeah. What would that group look like? Counties yeah. over and Yeah. I think, I think so. Obviously, you want, you want you want others involved too, but it, it, there has to be there has to be a sense of urgency articulated by public sector leaders at least that yes, we've got to make sure we give the people's business and the resources to do it, but that because of the DNA of our city as a capital city, hosting university and, and Fort Jackson uh, and everyone. Else, and a, a, a significant number of nonprofits, even some nonprofits that maybe profitable nonprofits, um, that we're just different than the rest of the state. And you, you tag on Act 388 on top of that, and it just creates a, a cocktail that arrests development in a way uh, in which we don't find desirable. It, it, it adds to the significant issue of affordability uh, for so many of our residents. And the only way we're going to tackle this, we, 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 we reduced our, our, our millage. I think much to the chagrin of some of our are really talented public safety, I mean, public um, uh, administrators uh, here uh, over the last several years. But that, that's been us doing what we should do uh, to recognize that, that um, our taxing policy is out of whack. But we represent, a, a, we, we did then, and we even now represent, I think back then we were probably 22 cents on, on, on 20, uh, 20 something cents, now we're representing 17 cents on the dollar. That if we're gonna attack this in a thoughtful, comprehensive way, it's going to require some, some really affirmative steps uh, by the county and, and school districts, which is one more than Richland too. And, uh, and I say that not, not casting any blame because the reality is that the amount of resources it takes to, to educate a child is still the amount of resources it takes to educate a child. And if because of our DNA we have depressed mill, uh, then then you still have to have the resources to educate our, our, our babies. And, I, and I, I, I'll stand behind it all day long. But, but there, but, We've had some successes and some failures in the last two decades and ways in which we work together to try and cut that overall tax um, liability. But something that requires a, a, a deep dive. We'll have the data, but I think we've got enough data to, to, to at least start pushing discussion, see if we can build some consensus on um, it can be difficult with the county uh, uh, some days. But we, we, get, we, got, we got a lot of, a lot of dialogue that just needs to happen there and gotta get some movement there. It's just important that we we have it comprehensively because every facet plays into it, and you know mm -hmm. there was a lot of different ideas, cap capping, pushing to do a referendum to cap the property tax, so that you know you're forced to have to make changes, and you know those are things that we we're gonna have to discuss down the road. So that's a perfect segue into the next section because I asked Missy and, and Jeff and I was doing this for you this effort that's been put into this discussion around the generation, even with all that effort, there's no silver bullet as of today going into this new, next budget cycle. And I agree, the continued discussions, maybe the negotiation of fees with the hospital system, others, even university, we need to continue all of those efforts, but we're still at the beginning of a new budget cycle where public safety, recruitment and retention plan has still not been funded where our public works officials are working hard every day to deliver phenomenal services. But we, we are in a budget year where I never try to be, oh, woe is me. But I think the reality is there that without some other type of revenue generation that we haven't found, um, we will probably have to be discussing some additional options with you all because basic service delivery um, does not and will not, I hope, suffer under my watch. So we've listed things um, that are just basic that we are seeing, um, beginning to see signs of suffering with funding for roads, sidewalks, city facilities, water and sewer. Um, I mentioned the public safety recruitment retention technology plan that has been presented to you. We want to fund that. Um, fire facilities, uh, we have several that the uh, 
Chief Jenkins and his staff have presented to you already. And obviously we have a growing capital replacement um, program that needs there. So Ms. Yen, I'm going to take over your discussion, but I really need to kind of drive that point home and we'll be getting into that in a much deeper dive as the budget discussions continue. But this, we're at that point. So, Ms. Wilson, we, we talk about this every year, um, and I see the proposed schedule that Missy has here. Um, but would it be I guess, beneficial if we start really looking at having these dedicated work sessions to, to talk through a lot of these issues yes. in depth? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Would love to. Um, and that's the, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. That's the thing that I'm probably getting at is. If we could talk through forensically some of the deeper, I, because I think some of the issues there, I think there has to be a deep dive into those things. The other piece of that, you talked about revenue generating. We had that conversation some months ago. I think. And that's something I think we need to really deep dive into how that those options might impact our budget. I think that as Mr. Benjamin was saying, and Mr. Richmond, when we were looking at the data, what is going to be the response as we, as that data continues to come online? Are we going to negotiate some fees? The issue, I think, why I said there's not been a silver bullet is because we know the tools we need in our toolbox, but whether it's state law or whatever other reasons that we presented to do the public safety GSP is not legally defensible in the atmosphere in which we find ourselves right now. So that is why it is a little bit of a dilemma <coughs> for us to not just be able to pull the trigger on some of these things. We know what we need to do. We research how maybe we can get it done, but we kind of come up to some brick walls at times when we're pulling the trigger. You know, it's people can't fight you when you got the data, and we yeah. can show clearly the discrepancy there. And even some, I mean, look, there's some agencies in there that passed a referendum that said it was thirteen dollars for a hundred thousand, and it's sixty dollars for a hundred thousand dollars. There's no cap in there, and so those are the things that we got to be able to address. But we got to have all the data, and it shows it completely. How to your point of Columbia being unique by having the comparison data from the other places in our state, we can clearly show that. And I think we're going to have to use that at the legislature, too, because we need them to give us the ability to address this issue unless they're willing to contribute to what we get. Right. And then when we have that data, though, we also need to talk about this, too, having those sit-down meetings and talking with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know the school district has started doing that meeting with them and giving them the data regarding how for the cost to, to educate the kids. You know, one of the things um, a lot of our legislators didn't know is that Richland One was impacted because the students at Alvin S. Glenn and, and, or, and PJJ were actually in their numbers and they fixed that last year. So I think if we have an opportunity to show them some stuff, We've talked to a lot of them individually, and I know Mayor Benjamin has talked to them more in depth, but having that data, and then, like he said, bring them to the table to help them come up with the solution. We shouldn't have to be figuring out all the solutions. They need to tell us these are the tools that you know we're willing to push forward and get passed. And I think that's why when we have the data, we can go to them. We've done a portion of it. You know, and then you got something that everybody can truly tangibly discuss. Right now, it's a lot of theories, and we have some good <coughs> indications, but not all of it is factual. And I think this will help us really have that discussion. How do we work with each other? You know, I mean, school district, are you, know, are you leveraging all your dollars the best way? And are we helping you? Because we're helping you grow too. We have to do it together. And so I think all of that comes into play. I think you're absolutely right. The sooner we get it, the sooner we have the conversations and we start having them. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, no matter how much data you have, you're not going to be able to change the bottom line for the city of Columbia by July 1st. The things that you're talking about are not doable under present law. If you want to well, do things, no, they, 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 you've got to 
face the reality that we've got to make some harder decisions on things that we can do within this city because you've got five months before the first of July and if we want to take care of some of these problems we've got to think about things that that are doable by this council well that was my point Howard. Uh, it's twofold okay. we have our work sessions where we're, we're around the table and we're actually making decisions because staff continues to bring us stuff there are several things that we need to say yes let's pull the trick on this that addresses the media but long term you know, that's only going to get us so far so we've right. got to talk long term about how do we address it so it, it's twofold i'm not saying one versus the other but we've got to do them both but we we just, we've got to make decisions in the next five months to get the extra 300 million dollars between water and sewer and general fund so that this council can do and we're all for having the discussion. So to Ms. Devine's point, Ms. I, you know, the budget drivers and the themes are here for you all um, in the essence of time. We just, you know, try to list some before you. But I think the real um, issue will be those workshops and how productive we make them in the discussions that we have. So what we could do is maybe bring back some, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the next few work sessions should, will be dedicated for budget. If there's some additional dates that we can get from you all that may work for you on an off Tuesday, then we'll throw those out and we'll get with Missy and Erica. Well, the sooner you can give us those dates, yes, the better. Sir. Absolutely. My social schedule fills up very quickly. <laughs> and of course. Mm -hmm. so that, that's the way we're going to Isn't it? Isn't that for some of your colleagues whose social calendar may not uh, check be as full? Cool. Uh, we'll, try to be, <laughs> we'll try to be conscious of maybe adding so, one so in February and one in March, and, and we'll share those dates with you. Okay. Yes. 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 this year so you know in the interest of time I, I won't rush through the presentation but I'll hit a, a few key points uh, within the presentation uh, please stop me as I, I go if you have any questions that we go through okay. so the agenda is here we're going to go through the purpose kind of talk about what's driving uh, what we're trying to do you know give you a little overview of the approach we'll take and then speak about a few areas that we'll kind of hone in or focus on. Uh, the purpose is, is just to perform a, an independent study that will provide us with the ability to estimate um, the, the water and sewers ability, water and sewers ability uh, to fund operating and capital programs to understand what it costs to serve your existing customers and thereafter determine how best to price those services. Are your existing rates appropriate? Uh, and if there are new rates or rates that we're looking at, how best to price those rates? So from an industry perspective, every utility tries to build a resilient water system for current and future generations um, that provides a, a high and acceptable level of service. So in, in trying to do this, what are the issues that are affecting um, utilities currently? The number one issue is aging infrastructure. Breaking pipe, for example. That's something that Columbia deals with. Can we can answer something? Sure. Do you have a good idea of what number one is for us? 
percentage. And just how about I mean, I mean how, how old is that? Yeah, what are we starting with? What, what are we building off of? I okay, so I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly if the question is which one of these items would be the number one for Columbia. That's probably more of a pin question. I'll say that for my beat that in a couple of weeks. But but it's pretty pretty typical across all the utilities. Yeah. Because we do this survey and we survey about three, four hundred utilities across the country that produces you know the results you see there. So you've seen some other ones out there? Yes sir. All right. So the second is the second issue is revenues. Are we generating sufficient revenues? Um, what is the weather doing? What is conservation doing? Um, the third issue is rates. You know, are we charging the rates? Do our customers understand the value of, of the water we're providing and the services we're providing? Then you have costs. You know, being resilient, information technology, and age and your aging workforce. This is all consistent and issues that Columbia as a city is currently dealing with. So what have you done? So Columbia has implemented and continues to implement a robust annual financial process, financial planning process that's tied to your budgeting process. We've identified best practices in executing this plan uh, and, and align these best practices with what Columbia is doing. So for example, you have de defined performance standards and you track how resilient you are against those performance standards on an annual basis. Uh, on an annual basis, you complete a five to 10 year financial plan as a part of your budgeting process to understand where you are currently and where you are going forward and what you'll have to do, you know, how agile you are to adjust to you know, your requirements going forward, whether operating or capital. Uh, you perform cost of service analysis as a part of these studies to understand what they cost to serve the customers. And then on, a, on, a, on an annual basis, you ensure that you're generating enough revenues to meet your requirements. So those four items are what we call best practices, and you are currently doing uh, these things. So what, what's driving your, your water and sewer utility? You know, it's a traditional mix of, you know, are we doing enough financial planning? Um, are we running a business that's fluid? And do our customers and our stakeholders understand uh, what we're doing? And the mix of this is, is what we're trying to, to achieve to run a sustainable uh, a utility, a sustainable business. What's driving the business? Maintaining revenue stability. You know, are you financially sufficient? Are you resilient as it relates to how you operate? You know, are you implementing your operating and capital programs? Do you have the resources as it relates to people, processes, technology? Are you meeting your regulations as you should? You know, how do you price the service you provide? And, and you know, are you competitive? You know, and these are things that are driving how you operate, and these are things that, you know, the folks running the business, folks on the back wall, and yourself here, you know, constantly monitor as it relates to how you're performing. So we understand what's going on in the, in the industry. We have a highlight of what we're doing. Now, how did we get here? Okay. You know, over the years, you know, I've been here a few times, and historically, always glad to have you. Thank you. We're really glad to be here as well. And historically, when we show this diagram or this illustration, we've had years where we didn't have increases and we've had lumps, and you've taken the decision to, 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 to look about structuring and implementing the necessary increases. So as an entity over the last you know, few years, there's been increases and I just commend you, you know, as an entity for, for you know, taking some tough decisions. So in addition to looking at rate increases, there are events that took place. And in looking at these events, you have desired outcomes associated with these events. Um, so for example, you're implementing a, an AMI program, and how does that program, for example, affect your revenue? You know, we want to achieve a consistent implementation of our capital program. You know, are we doing that? Yes, we are. You know, well, how does the continued 
target of making sure we achieve what the, re the requirements associated with the Clean Water 2020 program affect how we operate, all right? We're looking to build out the stormwater program, which you all have started to do, you know, and you know, staff is making sure that you consistently have the resources, whether it be people, processes, technology, for example, to do this. And then, you know, one area is how do you price your services, you know? You will be looking at your miscellaneous services, you know, you've looked at your expansion fees, and there's also the discussion around la large user fees and how they impact your business. You know, all these things are, you know, competing interests that have, has a desired outcome that we have to understand and appreciate and incorporate, which we do, into the analysis that we complete here. Robert, do you show us our, our expansion fees and large user rates compared to other utilities? We, if we can, when we come back? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so not to go in detail as it relates to this diagram, this table, but this is just a quick synopsis of what we showed you last year, and you know, upon getting the approval of the 2020 7.06, uh, we forecasted that we'll have a, a potential increase of 9.15% in FY 2021, which is 9.5, uh, and the goal I got, you know, I got hit upside the head you know, <laughs> because of this one. But the goal is to see how how we do against and if we can be better. Uh, and staff, you know, everybody has started to, you know, try to do everything we can to make, make sure that that number potentially comes in lower. But as we go through the process, we'll see. So we just wanted to highlight that this is where we were last year and this becomes the starting point and the baseline of how we go forward. Robert, is that mainly to get back to the to um, debt coverage, debt service coverage, or is it, because this year is the 128, so our current year will? Yeah, so, so a part of it, yes, is to support coverage, but it's also to support your requirements as it relates to capital, operating, and just the program that you're running as a, an entity. Robert, have you ever taken a look at this and and got wastewater out of it and just looked at it if we were just strictly in the water business? So when you say if we've ever looked at it, can you expound on what you, what <laughs> yeah. you mean exactly? Ha have you run a scenario or have we engaged you to run a scenario with us being out of the wastewater business? Formally? So, so Not formally, yeah. Yeah. So we've never been engaged to run a scenario, and I, I don't want to seem like I'm jumping around. No, no, no. That's your question, okay. We've never been engaged to run a scenario to say what it would take to be out of the wastewater business. So, you know, that's the first well, thing to answer I, your question. Yeah, I, I think probably yeah. two, two points of that would be is, what would it look like, number two, what would it look like if we were out of the wastewater business outside of the city limits where, well, our biggest cost, our biggest expense, and, and our biggest infractions are all dealing with wastewater, not water. And it'd be interesting what that would do to our model. Would we A, create more revenue, B, have more of an opportunity to maintain and, and, and um, have a more robust system um, and a lot more easier to maintain over its lifetime? Um, I don't know, I mean, just looking at the projections and the constant cost and this and that just may be worth looking at weighing out what's the benefit versus the, the cost. Where's more profitable than okay. that, So that's something we can talk to staff about and, you know, we can. This is unusually quiet today. <laughs> okay, so, keep moving. Okay. so since 2008 to FY20, you know, on average, we've looked at about a 4.7% rate increase. Um, that's an average. There are years when we've had to look at significant rate increases, and there's years over this period, multiple years, when there have been no, no rate increases. 
So that's, you know, generally around, and somewhere around or at the level of inflation. But one thing to, to, to try to understand as it relates to this number, and I'm going to step on here, is, you know, under, the, under our current rates, if we're to look at what tap water would cost on a per gallon basis, what <coughs> tap water would cost on a per gallon basis, it would be about 0 0.004 cents. Okay, so let's say now we, we, we took that number and we said, what would it cost on a daily basis for the, everything you just described, everything, all the infrastructure, everything we put in place, what would your water cost on a daily basis based on your current rate? It would be about 70, 76 cents, okay? On the other side, wastewater, if we were to say, what would it cost on a daily basis, sorry, it would be about 140, okay? So then, let's say we were to look at, you know, the cost of a gallon of bottled water would be a dollar for it, okay? Paying that dollar for that gallon of bottled water would be about 263 times higher than what you currently pay today for Except water. Except we charge you to dispose that water too, so if you add that, that in, Okay, maybe 70, and 80 storm time, water, time. We're going to charge you a stormwater fee it, too. So no, that. <laughs> but it would still be higher. The point okay. is, so so in, in understanding the value of water, what do you get for it? You get the ability to turn on that pipe on an instantaneous basis whenever you want water. You get the ability to shower, to use the toilet, to wash your clothes, to have good drinking water whenever you turn on the pipe. Um, you know, to, to, to wash your stuff, to cook, clean, you know. That's all the things you get for the water we're providing. So we, we kind of wanted to highlight that because it's, it's really important in trying to, you know, illustrate the value of water and the value of, of, of what we've been doing, what it is, okay? I would, I would tell you, Robert, I think most people recognize the value of our water system. Okay. I think when it comes to wastewater is where it becomes because that if you look at what we had to do for the EPA, we had 150 million in water, 600 million wastewater, and so I think that's where you know I think some of the angst comes from. Okay. <coughs> so we're trying to be the number one water. I know we're we're almost there. But we want to be number one. So. Our study approach is a three-step approach where we identify what the size of the pie, what the requirement is, the cost of service says who generates that cost, and the third step is the rate design that says how do we price the service. So we've highlighted some areas of focus that we will look on as we execute this project. Um, from a financial planning perspective, we look at the integrity of the financial system through our financial metrics. We'll try to understand how we're doing as it relates to implementing our capital program. Uh, and we'll look at, you know, the water and wastewater utility, you know, what it means for each entity to be self-sufficient. Additionally, we'll look at <coughs> what's the cost of providing ex existing services you do and what's the cost to provide services to potential large use customers that are under consideration, okay? And then in, in looking at your cost of service, what does it cost to provide your miscellaneous fees, your turn off fees and other, you know, other general fees, you know, that you currently have, you know? Is your, how does your expansion fee compare to other utilities? So we'll be coming back to you with all that information uh, and then on the rate design side, <coughs> we'll just look at what's the price of the services you know you, 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 you provide and is the price and your current rates appropriate. Uh, you know how do you again, how do we intend to price that mega user, large user, you know, and how do you look at its impact on development? You know, do you look at potentially some type of a development fund? You know, if there, there are different things you know, you can do as it relates to addressing this mega user or large user issue or opportunity that's currently on the table. So next steps.
Uh, we are in the process of collecting data. Um, we are going to be facilitating meetings with staff uh, to go over the project schedule, deliverables, the data we will require, uh, and then we'll get going. Okay, that's it. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. 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 It's about three to four months, and it's going to be in alignment with the project schedule, the approvals, and so we'll be coming back, right, say, in alignment with the budget schedule. All right, so we're at four I'd like to make a, a motion to go into executive session for receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney client privilege pursuant to 30 4 2 Convention Center of receipt of legal advice pertaining and threat to a pertain, pending, threatened, or potential claim pursuant to 30 4 2 LJ versus COC. State versus COC, discussion of negotiation instruments to propose contractual arrangement pursuant to 30 4 782 Underwriters uh, 2221 Divine Street Municipal Complex, discussion of matters related to proposed location or expansion of services to encourage location or expansion of industries or other business pursuant to 30 4 782 Park Street Project. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Mr. Vine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye.